All right, phase one. We're gonna start out by looking at an overview. So we'll take a couple slides to do an overview of phase one and then we'll move into the details. So phase one is located in the bone marrow. So that's where we're at. This is um, the whole goal of phase one of B cell development is to create a diverse and clonally expressed B cell receptors in the bone marrow. So it's all about the repertoire assembly or the creation of all the different B cell receptors that, that we need. So let's go back to how B cells are created initially, just B cells are part of the lymphoid lineage. And remember they come from that pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell. So we have our stem cell um, hanging out in the bone marrow. And at this point, this stem cell can become any cell of the blood. So that means it can become um, a red blood cell. It could actually end up becoming a um, neutrophil or it could go down the lymphoid lineage. And so we see, then we're gonna follow the pathway where the hematopoietic stem cell differentiates to the point of where it's going to become a lymphocyte. It's been committed down the pathway of the lymphoid lineage. So it's a lymphoid progenitor cell. At this point, it can produce both B and T cells, right? It doesn't have to become a B cell yet, but it has differentiated the point where it is going to be a lymphoid cell. This earliest stage is going to be called a pro B cell. And we'll look at this in detail. Um, important, you know, it has CD34 on its surface. And so that is going to be indicate of it being a, a progenitor cell, but then it also has other markers on it, for example, CD10. Um, at this point, the mRNA transcript for the mu heavy chain is made and translated. And then um, eventually, once it becomes a, a, a pre-B cell, but then once it becomes a pro-B cell, that means it's going to have um, a pre-B cell receptor on its surface, okay? So we're moving from the hematopoietic stem cell down to committing to become a B cell. During that process, the heavy and light chains are going to be rearranged, starting with the um, the D and the J rearrangement of the light chain of the variable region, and then moving into the D and the J, and then eventually bringing in the heavy chain. So we'll look at each one of those as we go along um, when we get into the details. But in the end, at the end of phase one, we should have what's called a B cell receptor, or at least a pre-B cell receptor. And that's going to mean that the cell has rearranged its light chains and it's rearranged its heavy chains by somatic recombination. The chains are functional. They're able to associate with each other. And then that is going to be shut down. Those immunoglobulin chain rearrangements will be shut down and um, a B cell receptor is exported to the surface. So the details we'll dig into are all kind of housed in this diagram here. There's no point in digging too deep into it now. Let's wait till we get to the details. But once we are at the end of B cell development, we have what's known as an immature B cell. And so an immature B cell will be ready to leave the um, leave the bone marrow. It's going to have bound IgM, maybe IgD on the surface. And it's going to be what we call naive because it has not been exposed to antigen yet. And so then it will move into the next stage of development uh, where it's gonna be searching for infection um, out in the secondary lymphoid tissues. So that's kind of the big overview. Now let's dive in deeper and look at each one of those steps in more depth. And so phase one is big. Phase one is gonna take the majority of the time and the rest of the phases are gonna be much, much quicker once we get to this first one. But you can see all the different stages of B cell development that we're going to discuss all the way from being this hematopoietic stem cell um, through the different stages down the lymphoid lineage, becoming that immature B cell. So we're going to see this diagram a few times. And I want you to notice that here we're looking at heavy, heavy chain rearrangement. We're looking at light chain rearrangement. Okay, Heavy and light chains are rearranged um, 
irrespective of each other because they're on separate chromosomes. And so somatic recombination is going to happen simultaneously, or it will happen um, independent of each other. That's the word I'm looking for. And then this last one is immunoglobulin status. So when the chains have been rearranged and put together, okay? So we have these different stages where at the stem cell, the hematopoietic stem cell stage, the immunoglobulin genetics are just germline. The genes have not been rearranged in any way. Segments have not been pulled out and added together. They're all just in order as the way that they were inherited from mom and dad. And so we call that germline for both heavy and light chains. And therefore there's not going to be any immunoglobulin on the surface because no chains have been rearranged. The very first thing that will happen is in the heavy chain, um, on the heavy chain gene segments, somatic recombination is going to occur starting with the D to the J. Now we talked about this when we looked at structure of immunoglobulin and I kept saying, first it's the D to the J and then the V to the D to the J and the D to the J to the V, right? You know, you would join those in after. And that's because of the progression that happens during development. So D and J rearrangement occur first. Um, and then once they have a successful rearrangement, then a V segment is brought in. And then we have a fully rearranged heavy chain variable region. At that point, that's when the light chain V and J segments are going to rearrange. And then when we have our fully rearranged V uh, heavy and light chain variable regions, that's when the, um, the chains can associate together and end up getting the constant region and, and pushed out to the surface. And that's when we can actually have surface immunoglobulin. At each step along the way, there's checkpoints to make sure that a pro early pre pro B cell can't move to a late pro B cell stage until a checkpoint has been passed. And so we see this happen at every single stage that there's going to be checkpoints in place to make sure that the segments rearranged properly, the proteins folded properly, the chains were able to associate properly, whatever it might be. And so we're going to see things where we can have productive rearrangements or we can have non-productive rearrangements. If we end up with a non-productive rearrangement, that means that the segments that were brought in do not translate into a useful protein and new segments have to be brought in to try to make a productive arrangement or rather a arrangement that is able to be transcribed and translated into a functional chain. And so those are productive rearrangements. Every B cell has two copies of the immunoglobulin heavy chain locus, right? So just like regular uh, Mendelian genetics, you get one copy from mom, one copy from dad. And that means that there's actually two chances and increases the likelihood that a pro B cell will be able to make a heavy chain um, productive arrangement. If a B cell makes a non-productive arrangement on one chromosome, it still has a chance to use the other chromosome to make a productive rearrangement. So those homolog, um, those hom homologous chromosomes, then only one needs to be able to produce a productive rearrangement. If developing B cells are unable to make a, a productive rearrangement on either chromosome, they lose their potential to ever be able to become a developed B cell and they will end up um, dying by apoptosis right in the bone marrow. They'll, they'll never get past that pro B cell stage. And we have two enzymes that are ultimately important um, in this recombination event, in the somatic recombination. And we talked about these before, but these are our recombination activating enzymes, our RAG enzymes, or genes, right? Reg1 and Reg2. So Reg1 and Reg2, there we go, um, are going to be vitally important during somatic recombination. There are other DNA modifying enzymes. We have like our AID involved as well. Um, and then our, our TPT, I think is what it is, um, that will do junctional diversity. But pretty much Reg1 and Reg2 are absolutely essential for the production of immunoglobulin um, chains.
Okay, so what does that look like then? We have our early, we have our pro B cells, okay? So our pro B cell is going to, we should be associating pro B cell with heavy chain rearrangement. We have our early and we have our late. So during early pro B cell, the D and the J segments are going through somatic recombination, working to make a productive rearrangement on one chromosome. If a productive rearrangement of the D and the J is made, then this is an indication of a productive rearrangement. Then um, the variable segments are brought in, and that's going to be happening in the low or in the late pro B cell. Okay, but we're still in the variable region of the heavy chain. Um, now we can have two things happen: we can either have a productive rearrangement made, or we can have a non-productive rearrangement made. If we have a productive rearrangement made, that means that the B cell is signaled to move on to the next step of development. A non-productive rearrangement can also happen. And so then we still have our second homolog. The second chromosome can be utilized to try to make a productive rearrangement of um, bringing in a variable segment into the D and the J. And that could make a productive rearrangement or it can make a non-productive productive, then great, it can go on and it can move on to the next stage of development. A non-productive rearrangement of the variable region of the heavy chain will lead to cell death um, in the bone marrow apoptosis. So this is a 50-50 chance if a cell is able to make a productive rearrangement of that heavy chain. Okay, but two chromosomes, so lots of chances for things to be productive and, and make a, a functional chain. Now, for a cell to actually then be signaled for survival, there has to be a heavy chain made, number one. And number two, that heavy chain has to be able to associate with the light chain. But I know what you're thinking. You're like, okay, that's fine. I understand. Yep, sure has to make a productive rearrangement on either chromosome of a heavy chain. But how are we able to tell if it's able to bind with a light chain when there's not a light chain to test it? The cell has a, a way to get around that. The cell actually makes what's called a surrogate light chain. It's a non-variable light chain. It's made up of V pre B and lambda five. Okay, so these two proteins together make up a surrogate light chain, a cha light chain that can be used to test its ability, the heavy chain's ability to actually bind with the light chain eventually. So it kind of mimics what a light chain is going to be like. It's invariant, and so the surrogate light chain is the same across. There's no multiple um, different specificities. But rather, the surrogate light chain is just there to test to see if this binding can occur between the variable portion of the heavy chain and what will be the light chain eventually. Now, this will happen in the endoplasmic reticulum. And so the heavy chain is going to be assembled from the transcript that is made through somatic recombination. It folds, and it will try to bind with the surrogate light chain. If the surrogate light chain is able to bind to the heavy chain, then we have what's called a pre-B cell receptor. So there's no antigen binding capabilities with the pre-B cell receptor, but rather just a check to make sure the heavy chain can bind to a light chain. If that occurs, then the cell's like, all right, great, I got a heavy chain, Let's make some light chain now. And so then assembly is shut down of the H of the heavy chain rearrangement because there's like don't worry about it we're good we got a heavy chain it binds surrogate light chain it's going to be great just stop making any more heavy chain um if it doesn't bind and these two the surrogate light chain and the heavy chain can't bind then that means that the heavy chain needs to be thrown away and um the cell dies by apoptosis it's a sad deal Okay, but this pre-B cell receptor does not have any antigen specificity and is created by the heavy chain binding a surrogate light chain. And this is in the endoplasmic reticulum. It has not been exported to the surface of the B cell. That's different than what we see in the B cell receptor where it is exported to the surface and it has a true light chain and a true heavy chain with antigen specificity. Okay, so in a pro B cell, 
Remember, pro B cell is the heavy chain rearrangement. Where rearrangement of the first immunoglobulin locus um, succeeds. So you have the first try on the first chromosome, makes a productive heavy chain rearrangement, and is able to bind to surrogate light chain. That means that the pre B cell receptor is um, is made, and that's going to shut down Reg gene transcription. So once the Reg gene transcription is shut down, that's going to shut down somatic recombination, which means that the second homolog will never get a chance to have rearrangement occur. And so this shutting down of the Reg gene prevents further creation of heavy chain rearrangements. And so you don't get a second heavy chain and every cell or and a cell will have one single heavy chain rearrangement on its surface. And we call this allelic exclusion. So a B cell is only going to express one of the two copies that it could potentially create. And allelic exclusion allows for a cell to have a single specificity for antigen eventually, making that B cell receptors across all of them together will have high avidity. We, we talked about avidity when we looked at immunoglobulin and avidity is like the overall strength of binding when you combine all of the antigen binding that occurs with immunoglobulin. So maybe mom's chromosome gets rearranged first in the one cell and creates a productive heavy chain rearrangement and dad's chromosome never gets to be expressed in that cell because mom's chromosome did it first. The next cell that may not be the case and maybe dad's chromosome gets rearranged first. It's totally 50-50. And so across an entire B cell population, both homologs are going to be expressed um, equally across the entire B cell population. So allelic exclusion, meaning only one type of heavy chain is going to be created on one single B cell. Okay, this is where we're at. So we've, we've talked about the pro B cell stage. And when we talked about the pro B cell stage, remember the pro B cell stage was when the heavy chain was rearranging. Okay, sorry. I was hitting the button, heavy chain. But now we're moving into the pre B cell. So we have our rearrangement of our variable portion of the heavy chain that's done. So it's completely rearranged. Now we're going to start looking and, and our heavy chain is made and it's attached to the constant mu, okay? So we have our heavy chain made, good. It's actually associated with surrogate light chain. And so we have a pre B cell. But now this is going to turn on the rearrangement then of our light chain variable region. Our light chain is going to start to be rearranged with the V and the J segments being brought together by somatic recombination. And so at this point, we have a B cell that has heavy chain. It's functional. It matches and, and binds to the surrogate light chain. So the B cell here is gonna go through division and division and division, several rounds until you get like about a hundred or so B cells that all have the same heavy chain. They're still binding to the surrogate light chain and so we know it works. And the whole point of making all of these cells that have the same heavy chain um, is because we got a heavy chain rearrangement that works. Let's keep it. If we know it works, let's go ahead and make a bunch of cells that have that same heavy chain. We can pair a, a different light chain with it and then end up with a hundred different specificities, even though the heavy chain is the same, but you pair a different light chain with it, the, very, the specificity is gonna change. So it's a way of protecting the investment that the body put in to making a heavy chain. It's like, hey, we got a good one. Let's use it for a lot of them. A lot of cells can have this heavy chain if it works. So now the B cell's like, okay, great. I got a whole bunch of these cells with heavy chains 
that seem to be able to bind to a light chain and we have our pre-B cells, let's turn on somatic recombination again and look at the light chain. So we have, I love this diagram because what it's showing is it's showing the reg proteins and expression. Um, so this is a schematic, it's a drawing, but imagine that this row down here is a, um, a gel, okay? So if you've ever ran gels where you see um, thick color or bands, that's where proteins are most present. And these red colorations are showing where the reg proteins, where those enzymes are most present. And you see the reg enzymes being most active while the, oops, while the heavy chain is rearranging. That says rearranging. <laughs> and then we see it turn off, it turns off at a point, right? Because this is the point where the heavy chain has been rearranged, meets with the surrogate light chain, the reg expression is shut down. Then is turned on again after those B cells have gone through this clonal expansion. And in every one of those now new daughter cells, they're going to turn on Ray expression again to get the genes going to do somatic recombination of the light chain rearranging. That says rearranging. So Ray expression goes on, goes off, comes on again when somatic recombination is needed. And um, that's when the light chains then are going to be rearranged during um, this immature still phase of the B cell. There's a, a pre-B cell um, being made. So just like what we saw with the heavy chains, the light chain rearrangement is also going to occur on one chromosome at a time. And we do have two homologs, one from mom, one from dad. But think back to chapter four, there's actually two different options for light chain. There's a, a kappa light chain and a lambda light chain. So we essentially have four different opportunities now for a light chain rearrangement to be made. There's only one single joining between the V and the J. And so the segments are brought in depending on which chromosome it starts with. A J segment is brought in, a V segment is brought in, and then it's joined with the constant, either kappa or lambda, depending on which chromosome we're on. So four different opportunities for these rearrangements to be productive. So here is the diagram of the light chain, which is similar to the heavy chain, but notice we have four options. So we're in our pre-B cell stage, the heavy chain has been rearranged, and we're just looking at light chain rearrangement. Starts on usually the kappa, one of the kappas, either from mom or from dad, and it will try to make a productive rearrangement. If it does, excellent. Then that light chain is going to be transcribed and we end up with a kappa light chain joining with the heavy chain that's already made. If that doesn't work, then we have the kappa light chain of the other chromosome, whether it's from mom or dad, it's the other homolog, tries to make a productive rearrangement. If so, great. We have a kappa chain um, bound to then the heavy chain. If either of those two, though, are unproductive, it's going to move into one of the chromosomes of the lambda uh, locus. And it can either make a productive rearrangement and give a lambda light chain that associates with the heavy chain, or it could be non-productive, try on the other homolog. If that's productive, we get a lambda light chain associated with the heavy chain. If it's not productive, ugh, after four attempts, we'll then die by apoptosis. And so we see that the heavy chain rearrangement is actually harder and um, doesn't Produce, only about 50% make it. Light chain rearrangement is a little bit better and about 85% of rearrangements end up, or uh, the production, so like if we had 100 of those cells all go through a rearrangement, about 85 of those would be able to make a productive rearrangement with the four opportunities it has to get a light chain that will associate them with the heavy chain. Okay. Although there's no functional difference between the kappa and the lambda light chains, as far as we know, 
Um, the benefit of having both Kappa and Lambda is that we increase the opportunity that a cell has to make a light chain that will uh, match with the heavy chain. So pretty, pretty great that that can happen. Okay. We have a light chain with a functional rearrangement combined to the heavy chain that we already know has a functional rearrangement. And, um, and it is occurring in all of these, these clonal cells, that population of 100 cells independently. And so, yes, they're all going to have the same heavy chain, but because they're all happening individually in those cells, they're all going to have a different light chain. That means every cell is going to have a different antigen specificity. Okay. The association of those light chains with the heavy chain will happen in the endoplasmic reticulum. It will be then shunted out to the, um, it will first associate with Ig alpha, Ig beta, and then be moved out to the surface of the B cell. So then when we have a functional heavy chain, joined with a functional light chain in association with Ig alpha and Ig beta, that is going to make a fully um, productive B cell receptor on the surface of a B cell. Now, the B cell is still considered immature because it has not gone through any type of education yet. It's just been developed, it's just been growing. Um, it has a heavy chain that's been rearranged. It has a light chain that's been rearranged. The light chain is able to associate with the heavy chain. They're both able to associate with Ig alpha and Ig beta, and they're moved to the surface of the B cell. But beyond that, the B cell's super immature because it hasn't been able to do anything yet, but make that, um, make that chain. We also or make that B cell receptor. We also have this allelic exclusion occur with the light chain. So once a functional light chain has been made, a uh, functional rearrangement, reg complexes are shut down so that there's no further rearrangement on the other chromosome loci um, so that we only get one single per cell. We get one single light chain. So across a, a cell then will have a B cell receptor that will have a single light chain, a single heavy chain, and have the same antigen specificity across the B cell, providing for high avidity. Okay, now we talked about this. We've gone through this, the, the, the big steps in B cell development, but let's go ahead and look at where checkpoints come in. So when we have a, Oh, sorry, I'm just looking at my slide numbers here. Okay, we have a few more slides for this lecture. Um, there's two checkpoints that the B cell is um, crossing or going through during this development. We've already talked about them, but let's just highlight where these checkpoints occur. Number one is at the end of the pro B cell stage because we're testing the cell's ability to make a heavy chain of good quality. And so we, we check to see if that um, heavy chain can associate with a surrogate light chain. If so, that cell is allowed to survive and multiply uh, and make a whole bunch of cells that have that same heavy chain. If that heavy chain cannot associate with the pre- uh, with a surrogate light chain, then it dies. The second checkpoint occurs later at the small pre B cell stage where we're looking for the ability of the cell to make a functional light chain that associates with the heavy chain. If that occurs, then the cell is able to go on and become an immature B cell with a B cell receptor out on the surface. If it does not make a light chain that associates with the heavy chain, then that cell dies. And only B cells that pass both of these two checkpoints are, allow are allowed to go on and make bound immunoglobulin. So here is exactly that thing in picture form. So we have our, our pro B cell stage over here. We have our pre B cell stage right in this area. I guess kind of, yeah, right in here where the light chain rearrangement occurs. And so we have our hematopoietic stem, or this is a pro B cell, so it's already in the lineage, is committed to becoming a B cell. Yeah. 
our heavy chain rearrangement occurs, we're making sure that our, and this is our surrogate light chain components, we make sure at the first checkpoint that the rearrangement of the heavy chain is able to associate with the surrogate light chain. If it can, yay, it goes on to um, the next stage. If it can't, it dies by apoptosis and it, it's done, okay? If it does, in fact, make a heavy chain that is able to associate with the surrogate light chain, then it's called a pre-B cell receptor and light chain rearrangement is starting to occur. And when the light chain is then tested for its ability to bind to the heavy chain, then it is able to associate with Ig alpha and Ig beta. We have a, a immature or an immature B cell. If the light chain that is made is not able to associate with the heavy chain, no pre B cell or no B cell receptor is made, and the cell dies by apoptosis. So checkpoint one, checkpoint two. We're checking to see if the heavy chain is able to associate with a potential light chain at checkpoint one. And at checkpoint two, we're checking to see if the light chain actually does associate with the heavy chain. Now, because this is immunology, there's always a but. <laughs> yeah, this process of B cell development is pretty much the default and what we'll talk about when we talk about B cells and B cell receptors, but not all B cells follow this pathway because that would be too easy, right? Uh, so B1 cells are different. The pathway that we talked about are for B2 cells and that's gonna be our default. So we do not refer to them as B2 cells. We just refer to them as B cells, but we know when we say B cell, we mean a B2 cells, conventional default B cell. And that's the one we're gonna talk about the, the most of the time. If we do ever talk about B1 cells, though, these are slightly different in the way that they create their antigen specificity, and they actually make antibody that's polyspecific. So we'll talk about B1 cells very seldom, and for some individuals, B1 cells can be very important because it might be the only way that they're able to produce antibody, um, but they are um, typically seen prior to birth. And so we'll see B1 cells made in the developing fetus, um, but after birth, B1 cells really aren't made anymore. Um, we see a lot more IgM made with a B1 cell than we do the, the conventional B cell. And um, yeah, so there's there's really not a whole lot that we'll, we'll deal with with B cells in this course, but just know that when we talk about B cells, there are two different types, but we are referring mainly to B2 cells. All right, I want to wrap up this lecture then with this summary slide. I love these summary slides because it shows everything we talked about in a very condensed um, picture fashion, right? We have our pro B cells where we have heavy chain rearrangements. We have our pre B cells where we have the light chain rearrangements. We have our checkpoints to make sure that here's a checkpoint to make sure that the heavy chain can bind with the surrogate light chain. And then we have our checkpoints here where we make sure the light chain is able to associate with the heavy chain. If productive rearrangements are made, we end up with a heavy chain that will either bind with kappa or lambda light chain, depending on which one makes a productive rearrangement. And then they will also get associated with Ig alpha, Ig beta in the endoplasmic reticulum and be moved out to the surface of the B cell. And at the end of phase one, we are left with an immature B cell. It's not educated, but it simply has a functional B cell receptor on its surface. All right, that's where we'll end this, um, this lecture and we'll pick up with phase two in the next one.